Ready? Yes. Are we ready here? Yes. Okay. Sounded like nobody was here before, but now I realize that there's a lot of people. And thank you very much for coming uh, to this workshop. Um, we have um, a few good speakers that are going to help us to guide a little bit this discussion. But first to start, I'd like to uh, introduce ourselves very quickly. We don't have a lot of, a lot of time. But I'd like to know who, are, who is here. And you can say your name and organization, or whatever you want to say that you're kind of representing, or not representing. You can just by yourself, right? As a citizen. So let's go do, do it quickly, and if we start from here. Hi, um, I'm Mike, and I film as Joe Anybody, and I'm with Portland Indie Media, so to speak, in the peace community. Uh, I'm Kurt Bell, I'm with the PDX Peace and People of Faith for Peace. I'm Don Alexander, I'm a retired teacher's member. I'm Sharon Pazniegra with the Nonprofit Program here at Portland State, and I'm a member of the AAP. Mm -hmm. I'm Sylvia Hartman, and I'm not representing anyone. I do work with the Recruiter Watch. I'm Diet Walid. I work with the Oregon New Sanctuary Movement and uh, uh, seriously pissed off grannies when they're doing something. Oh, hi, my name is Stephen Biden. Just here to listen, talk to you. But here, uh, Brad Forrest, I'm just a citizen. <laughs> I'm uh, Roberto Lovato, and I'm with the uh, Oak Grove Peace Vigil and the Blue, Blue Hour Protest people. I'm Greg Burrell, who's a teacher and a philosopher, and I'm Greg Earl, who's a bassist and a vocalist. I'm here to figure out how to have peace. I'm Matt Weber. I'm here. <laughs> Good. I, 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 Barry Sutton, and I'm just in a lot of things everywhere. Thanks. Uh, Jim Cowing, uh, ILWU uh, Local 5 at Pell's Books, and uh, John's a Justice Member. I'm Katie Heald. I'm with the PDX Peace Coalition, and I'm AFSC in Portland. And uh, I'm here to start figuring out how we can organize for peace. I'm Dallin. I'm not representing anybody, um, except for the land war tax sister. Consider that one My name is Kim and I go to Portland State and I'm here with Dr. Chris. My name is Will, I work for the Portland Peace Council. I'm Gresho, I'm from Walter Institute and the Military Draft Council. Thank you, Will, and I hang out with Witness for Peace. And she's part of the um, committee, solidar committee solidarity, uh, in solidarity, or solidarity and mutual support. Committee for solidarity and mutual support. And mutual support, right. Which is Sisa and Spanish. I'm Emiliana Aguilar, and I'm in the same group. Liliana Aguilar is part of the same group. My name is Zaida and I am also part of the same group. Zaida is part of the same group. My name is Abdias Cortez and I am also part of the same group. Yes, Abdias Cortez and I am part of the same group. Um, I'm Meredith with the International Social Organization and PDX Peace Coalition. I'm Becca. I'm also with the International Social Organization. Rod Daggett, Southeast Portland. Cindy Pauley. My name is Melvin Kravitz. People call me Preacher Moses because at age 13, I was bar mitzvahed at a Jewish ceremony and given the name Moshe Ben Yisrael. But at age 18, because of reading Matthew and one half of Mark, I walked into the YMCA of Brooklyn and said, I must be baptized. I am now 66, so I am an old man, 
you who lives two blocks from the library, I am your neighbor. And everyone that I speak to, I greet with the words, my cousin. And since living in Portland for three years, I have become known as Mr. Homeless Rescue Man. All right. Thank you very much. And now the last person over here. Great. Just introducing yourself and who you represent if you want to. Oh, nice. Hi, I'm Jamie Dawson. Mm -hmm. And the last person here. Introduction. Sure. Sure. Your name? Oh, me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think that always is good to know who, who we are, who's here. And it's nice to hear that we come from a very diverse. Um, uh, group of people here uh, in our community here in Poland. So as we know, this workshop is ending militarism, as you have in the in the in the program, and it's ending militarism and promoting a peace and development foreign policy. In the, you probably read that it says bad military expenditures creating nothing useful, sad the real economy, and a foreign policy based in killing and using military force requires ever greater military budgets. How extensive is the damage and how can the swords be beaten into plowshares? Plowshares. Plowshares, thank you. Um, so, um, but first, uh, uh, before we go with the speakers, we're going to have a little debrief about the, the, the session that we just had. Yeah, how can be beaten into plowshares is, is getting the crime out of the military complex. Mm -hmm. Crime is stealing it. About three trillion dollars in 19 in 2007. That this guy got a, a photo award for, and he was on Bill Moyers. Three trillion dollars that disappeared. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, hey, first, I want to. Is there somebody here taking notes? Right. I understand. I don't care for this workshop. No. Or we just cut the videos then. As, uh, okay. no, I don't have any materials. Huh? There we go. Thank you very much. It would be good to have some notes. Uh, the I so, yes. I would like to inform everyone that in Manhattan, New York is the United Nations building. Uh -huh. And there is a statue of a farmer who is taking a sword and beating it into a plowshare. And the words, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and they will never learn war anymore, were uttered 2,800 years ago by a man, Isaiah. And those words are found in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 of the Holy Bible. And they are so important, a man named Micah in his fourth chapter repeated it. So beating swords, metal, the riches of the earth that should be used for neighbors to do nice things and have plow chairs. Thank you, thank you very much. Put into tanks and bombs yeah. and must be changed. Exactly. And that's why we're here. And I, I want to explain a little bit how we're going to do it the purpose of this, this part. And uh, we are going to debrief a little, a little bit the plenary session that we had. And I would like to uh, ask you, since we have short time, when you're going to speak, use uh, just a few words, time to you know put a little bit in, in short words, so then more people can have the opportunity to speak. Uh, so the idea is that. Um, to find the topics that relates, you know, to I mean the, the things that relate what we just listened before heard, you know, in the in the plenary session to this topic, you know, the topic that we have right now, which is the ending militarism and promoting the peace and development foreign policy. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Uh, we need to think always about the perspective of what to do with this, not just 
we come to you know make a, a critical thinking about it and judgment of what's happening, but always putting in the back of our heads what can we do about it, and and including the what can we do about it, we're going to include how are we going to be organizing about it. So we work as a community, and and again I thank you all of you for being here, and I see there's a very diverse group of people, and so how us being that very diverse can be working together um, with uh, the same end. And of course, this is to meet, you know, us, you know, between us and these very diverse people in knowing which organizations are here. So I'd like to ask you, you know, um, as a little bit debrief, you know, um, what, uh, what is that your first reaction, the, the first thing that you got the most, you know, important in the, in the plenary session there that gave a very critical message? that you think that we need to, to take into account? I really liked that um, instead of focusing on the fact that it's, people feel like it's just our country that's going, this is pretty simple, I guess, but the, it's just our country that's experiencing this, experiencing this right now, it's the whole world, and we need to really build up other infrastructures instead of you know fighting against them and, and hurting other people in other countries. And that, you know, we need to think of this in terms of a global solution instead of just a solution for our country. Thank you. Did you and then? The prospect of reducing the military budget in order to fund some of the things that we need locally. <coughs> I uh, understood that uh, the economic problems that we have now are not going to be solved by a stimulus that it goes back to just where we were, but we need some, some new structures, and I think maybe that also relates to our, our military aspirations, too. I think it was interesting, um, one of the speakers said that um, when we talk about economic problems and how to solve them, that the military spending is most often not on the table, not even up for consideration. Uh, who was for it? You was first. And you. Uh, the fact that our country is the world's largest arm dealer, arms dealer, and that in no way produces peace in the world. Well, that it's uh, going to be every individual personally is responsible for this crisis, and that we can't really put the blame on anyone if we're not going to put the blame on ourselves first and foremost. Thank you. Some other reactions to what we... Yes. Um, the idea that there, we can't wait for the government to do it for us, that we need to get involved, we need to become active. Oh. Uh, also, the idea that, that corporations are, are trying to twist our thinking and, and um, inflict the, the blame for this on ourselves when it's, it's something that happened from an outward structure that has to be changed in the dollar One, two, three, and corporations, oh, my yes. and corporations are not a piece of thing, it's some of your neighbors. It's immoral neighbors, bad men, who don't have good priorities, who believe in war rather than peace, who steal from Wall Street. They are immoral. So that I had the pleasure of a six-minute conversation with the last speaker, and I said, couldn't you have just given in your speech three sentences? We are immoral. We are the most powerful of the worldly family. We need to change. So we need to change. How do you change we? The first one to change is yourself, your heart your attitudes. 
Thank you. Well, um, I, I think that you know when we talk about all of this like economic stuff, it seems very and that it's global. It's, it can also seem very kind of overwhelming. Like what can we, you know, these structures have been wrong for decades, and what can we do about it? But what I liked about what Veronica was saying that it, it's as simple as the, the, the first step is the increasing democratic participation. And if we can increase democratic participation in all these different levels of our society, that will that will fix these problems. It's not like an insurmountable you know, obstacle. And that was inspiring. A technical question. Don't, we should have a list of all the people here for future action. Yes, I think that you did sign up before, right? But just for this group? Uh, well, yeah, we can have a list if we want to do that. If that we're going to do further actions, we got to know who's in the group and how to get a hold of them, right? That's a good point. So let's let's pass it around. Uh, if somebody can help me with that, maybe. Does anybody have extra paper? Uh, with a paper, and you put uh, your name, organization, and contact information. Is that good? Thank you. Thanks for for the point. Yes. Uh, I want to also suggest people from organizations if they'll put their websites up on the board, then we can all copy down and and communicate with the organization. Or if we put it in, in that page, we can uh, put it on a on a, an electronic document and we can send to everyone. Is that good? Okay. Okay. Uh, any other reaction to what we heard with specific speakers, if you want? I also like the this. Uh, the idea that there are actual models out there, either in Western Europe or Latin America, that mm -hmm. can show us the way to make it through this crisis. Exactly. Thank you. And um, <coughs> the sociology professor uh, raised the question of uh, nationalization and how we've, we've uh, demonized uh, government ownership of things. And there's been a hell of a lot of privatization in uh, the military, particularly in logistics. And that's further bloating the military industrial complex. And it's um, making the, uh, uh, the military industrial complex more aggressive, more interested in conflict, and rebuilding from conflict. Um, and I think it's uh, it's been shown to be a disaster in Iraq. And so this is a uh, a place where the military industrial complex is politically vulnerable right now. We have an opening to talk about what exactly do we get for our military spending dollar. And to break through some of the, uh, the political mythology around military spending. Thanks. And we're going to cover a little bit of that in the, in the presentation that we have. So this is a warm up to start thinking about the issues and, and then we continue with the speakers. Now, but Will, you, you have the... <coughs> okay, perfect. So, um, any other uh, burning issue that you think that came out from the, well, there was a lot of those, but one more. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to say that it seems as though for 5,000 years, we've been organizing into hierarchical, agriculturally fueled military societies to the point where only the most ruthless, cutthroat military societies exist on the earth. And there, it seems as though the way to get around this means to mobilize people all over the world to keep their government from pursuing these types of military goals rather than, you know, if we were to suddenly get rid of our army, all the people that are angry at us would conquer us in weeks. So what can we do so that there aren't armies all over the world? Thanks. That's a good point. Any other? Okay, well, I think that now uh, it's time to go to the next uh, part of the speaker, but I'd like to highlight a little bit of the things that came up, that just to think about it and how we connect to what is coming next. And, um, we were talking about the, the military budget and how big it is, right? And, and we're going to have a talk about it also. Um, but how also in the culture of this country, the military and that issue is not be really being put on the table to be discussed. Not in Congress, well, sometimes maybe, but not especially uh, for us, you know, for the people. So that's one, one main thing that we need to think about and connect that with what we were saying uh, a minute ago. 
about organizing and mobilizing and really, you know, who we are and what kind of rights do we have in terms of leading this nation, you know. Because one of the things that we are going to have to think about is how to organize, as I said in the beginning. Uh, what is going to be our role? And when we were talking about the we, I'd like to say a little bit more about that because we always, we talk about we invaded, we did this, we did, did that. We are validating that because we didn't do it. So just think about that. Uh, it's the government. What we say is we are going to go against it. We, I was against that. We are against that. It would be good to think about that in terms of rebuilding our identity as country, as a community, right? And, thank you. And uh, the other thing is important that somebody said here uh, that about how uh, egocentristic we are in this country. Again, I said we are. <laughs> But anyway, it's part of the language, huh? It's, it's how we think that this country is the only thing in the world, the only power, the only, the only one, you know? And that really, we don't think about learning from others. We think about others, about third world, second world, somebody that we're gonna be intervening in terms of ideas, of technology, everything, but not really learning from those, just taking advantage of those. So let's think about that in terms of also the military presence that we have and, and, and how we function as a country. Just Very short, moment, please. Uh, John Perkins was on a night before last night, <coughs> speaking in 2007 at Paul's book. He wrote the book, uh, Confessions of an Economic Kid, and he knows all about that stuff. He's a good guy now. We've talked about sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last part is about the, the military uh, industrial complex and how that got to the point that now it's legalized it's very official and supported by the government, the, the mercenary training and hiring. And now it's, you know, Blackwater and all of those, right? Those 20 years ago were seen as mercenaries being paid to kill people. Go to Central America, go to Africa, go to here, there, anywhere. And now it's everything is the business, right? And how that complex has been advanced, you know, in, in the capitalist world. So let's think about that, and now I'd like to actually go to the next part and introduce uh, our speakers. Um, we have um, three people here that came uh, to help us with this part, and we have uh, one to two is Will, Will Simon. Uh, it's a local volunteer organizer on foreign policy and human rights issues whose work has ranged from East Timor and Indonesia, Central America, labor rights, Palestine, Israel, and the wars and occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you probably have seen Will playing also the, the what's it called, the, the troop? The drums. The drums, right? Always uh, in, in, in downtown, every Friday, right? Uh, around, you know, the Palestinian-Israel conflict and, and solidarity with, with the people. Um, in recent years, his work has uh, concentrated on producing public affairs programming for community radio and on-demand streaming streaming via the internet through PDX Justice Media Productions, and you can go to his website, pdxjustice.org. He is a volunteer with Portland People Response Coalition, which is the one I'm talking about every Friday. Um, involved in the mobilization set for March 15th down in Salem, that you're gonna let us know a little more about that, uh, and marking the sixth anniversary of the Iraq war and aimed at stopping the Spring the deployment of the Oregon National Guard to Iraq and Afghanistan. So welcome, uh, Will. <laughs> also, uh, I want to introduce um, a Katie Hill. Is that how you say? Hill. Sorry. English is my fourth language. It's not my first. Uh, is the in interim peace program director for the Poland area AFSC office and an organizer with PDX Peace Coalition. She also um, sits on the steering committee of the National Anti-War Coalition, United for Peace and Justice. She will be examining the real price tag for our military spending and giving us some concrete tools to use in organizing toward a peace economy. Welcome, <coughs> Katie. And also, I want to welcome uh, John Bouchot that we saw before, and, and John has been working on in counter recruitment. And you can say a little more about yourself, please, uh, that came to help us also today uh, to be part of this, this uh, interesting discussion. You want to say a little more about yourself? Oh, 
Okay. Um, I coordinate the military draft council project, and we work primarily in, in local schools trying to um, do outreach to, to, to high school students about issues of military recruiting and enlistment and that kind of thing. And the main thing I wanted to say is I think one thing that's really important, there aren't a lot of young people at this meeting today, as you can see. There are some, but not, not a lot. And uh, I think it's really important that we um, you know, do outreach work to, to students and other young people in the community and also uh, listen to what they have to say about these issues because they are in fact the upcoming generation and without their help, we're probably not going to make a lot of progress in the long run. So I, I, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, and I think the general also was involved, the general, how much about John, and the process that Portland was one of the few cities in the country that didn't allow the Portland Public Schools uh, did not allow the, the military to be there recruiting in school. Uh, but now we have back again, but the, the child, the, the, the child, child left behind. But that was Portland, and, and John has been here through that process, right? Uh, anyway, so uh, thank you very much. And let's start now. We're going to start with uh, Katie. Uh, and Katie has a um, slideshow that she's going to be using for her presentation. So, um this is a slideshow developed by American Friends Service Committee. Um, I don't. I, I think a lot of this is not going to be entirely new to all of you because that's what we've kind of been talking about this morning. Some of the things you guys said already. But what I think can be helpful about this slideshow is it will give us a little more of the specifics of some of the things we've been talking about. That will give us kind of more concrete tools to use as we're doing this organizing because um, it gives us some more of the numbers and and <coughs> images to kind of grab onto. So. Um, uh, and it's a lot of the stuff that Veronica was talking about at the very end of her piece about the costs of war and how much that is and what money isn't going into other things. So this will examine the price that we pay in, not only in dollars but also in human suffering as well as some of the lost, it's like the hidden costs of the war that are in the lost opportunities that we could have spent the money somewhere else. So, um, uh, so we're going to start by looking at um, how much our nation spends on the military versus other budget prior, budget categories. And this is a um, banner that AFSC, uh, a chapter, made. And we've actually got a version here that we can use for things here. It's basically a banner that shows the, the um, annual discretionary budget of the United States. Um, and this banner shows federal spending above and beyond fixed entitlement programs such as Medicare and Social Security. But as you can see, the red section there is the military budget, which is 50% of our, of our taxes. And um, this does not include military spending on the Iraq War, uh, which is that additional section you can see on the right, there's a whole nother red banner that has to be added on to show the uh, supplemental amount that um, that the, that Bush has typically used to pay for the Iraq War. Um, and at the moment, we don't know what the current, um, basically Barack Obama is, the, uh, the current budget that's sitting in Congress is the one that Bush recommended for fiscal year 2010 before he left. Now, what everyone expects is that Obama is going to bring an alternative 2010 budget, but at this point it doesn't look like we're going to see that till April. So at this point we really don't know. Um, there is There are differing opinions about whether uh, um, Obama's is going to look essentially the same and not be all that different, and people who think it's actually going to really shock a lot of people in how drastically different it is, but we really aren't going to know that for a couple months. But the current Bush administration budget that is sitting in um, in in the request is for a $581 billion defense, defense budget for fiscal year 2010 and has plans to send Congress an additional um, $80 billion supplemental. Um, and um, this, is the, the Pentagon has announced that they already don't think that this request is enough for them, even though this is almost double the fiscal year 2002 defense budget. So. Um, they don't think that's going to be enough. Um, and that would be basically $1.5 billion a day, uh, not including Iraq. So we'll see what happens as the spring unfolds. But that's kind of something we have to keep on our radar as far as an organizing 
where does the sure. Iraq end? Just at the end of the, uh, the word war? It goes war? almost. It's a, it's a tiny bit farther, but it's that's basically the person is on the edge of the photo oh. there. Does this count um, the, this uh, the surge in, a, in Afghanistan? I believe this was 2000, the 2000. Um, nine. <coughs> this was the fiscal year 2009 budget and the supplemental um, from 2008. So it's all a little bit bigger now, but it's pretty much the same thing. And the small square to the left of that arrow, the green square right there, that is international relations, which includes foreign aid, development, and diplomacy. So <laughs> that just shows where our priorities are currently in our budget. And I think we would all say that we would want to see that be the majority of our foreign spending um, and not in the military, but instead in foreign aid and development and diplomacy. So, and um, so at this point, the U.S. is outspending our enemies 23 to 1. <laughs> um, if we look at the annual military spending of Bush's so-called axis of evil, um, we are outspending Iran, Syria, and North Korea combined by nearly 23 to 1. Um, and so this just shows, uh, you know, does, is this really what we need to make us safe? Is this is increasing how much that more that we have than everyone else really what is what's going to make our, our country better, safer? Um, and so, you know, if you might be wondering how we managed to spend all this money on the military, well, here's an example. This is the new generation of fighter jets, the F-35 Lightning II. Each plane costs a mere $122 million. Oh, wow. And if um, you actually add up the total cost to build 2,500 of these, train the pilots, operate and maintain the fleet, it comes out to more like a trillion dollars. Um, and in a moment, we'll discuss how these trillions could be spent and what we're giving up by investing this in the military. Uh, so the next question is, who's getting rich and how? Um, well, from 2004, as we were just, someone else was just discussing, to 2006, U.S. government contracts in Iraq and Afghanistan alone doubled from 11 billion to over 25 billion. Um, so if you look at exactly how these immense military contracts are awarded, this is another big problem that we're facing as organizers. According to this chart, um, the deep red represents the percentage of Pentagon contracts signed with less than full and open competition. Those light red slivers in those represent the cases of so-called full and open bidding uh, with only one company making a bid. And um, the center also found that the system was marked by missing contrast contracts and completely unidentified companies. The center's latest study of Pentagon contracts found that one third of the $13 billion in contracts in Iraq and Afghanistan were cost plus fixed free agreements. So basically, um, they're agreeing to take a certain amount of money. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether they actually deliver on their end of the contract. So it's a completely one-sided contract um, with absolutely no oversight from Congress on whether or not they actually um, deserve the money. And plus, they get to re get money for any cost overruns they choose to report. So they can say, actually, we need twice as much money, even though we never built those schools. And they have to have that, be given that money from our tax dollars. So um, one question you might, that, that we do encounter a lot, especially working with labor unions and some more conservative parts of the country, is, but aren't these contracts helping our workers and boosting our economy, right? Because these are people who are getting jobs by working in these, or, in these companies. Well, in fact, if you look at the top military contractors in Iraq, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, foreign firms make up almost one third of the top 100 contractors. Um, so actually a lot of that money is not coming into the United States at all and not getting our workers jobs. By contrast, U.S.-based minority-owned businesses receive less than one-tenth of one percent of the total primary contracts awarded in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and one specific example of how military spending is not adding, end up um, helping U.S. workers or our economy, investigative reporters at the Boston Globe discovered that the largest military contractor, KBR, which used to be called Kelly Brown and Root, and is part of Halliburton, <coughs> Um, created a shell company in the Cayman Islands called Service Employees International. And SEI then hired over 21,000 workers from the United States, hired U.S. citizens 
through their Cayman Islands company. This maneuver allowed KBR to classify U.S. employees as foreign workers, so they did not have to pay Social Security, Medicare taxes, or unemployment insurance for these 21,000 workers. So the Boston Globe estimates that this actually cost the U.S. government over $500 million in taxes over the last three years. Um, and this is even bad news for the actual workers because they are considered for as working in a foreign country and not working in the United States. They are not able to apply for unemployment compensation if they lose their jobs and they are getting no credit towards their social security um, while uh, through the whole time that they've worked for Service Employees International. So it's really not a good situation for the workers either. Um, now, what's the real price tag of the Iraq War and ongoing occupation? Um, because many of this doesn't even appear in budgets or contracts issued by our government when you really think about it. So some of you might have heard of, actually um, Barry just mentioned this, um, Joseph Stieglitz of Columbia University and Linda Vilms of Harvard did extensive research to calculate the total costs for the first four years of war and occupation. And unlike other analysts, they included both current and future costs that aren't necessarily in that you know, defense budget um, line item. So just for operations, this like bar on the left here, um, the U.S. spent $12 billion per month. Um, and but if you move, and so this is one day, it's broken down, $310 million a day, which comes out to $12 billion a month. As you move across the chart, they added in ongoing medical bills for vets returning with physical and psychological injuries. They added interest payments on the debt because we're borrowing money to fund this war at the same time we've been giving tax cuts to wealthy people. And the last one there is overall increases in the Department of Defense budget um, which includes things like recruiting campaigns, um, funds for private contractors, military equipment, all kinds of other things they've had to spend more money on because they're trying to keep these massive occupations going. Um, so when they factored all of these in, they, they decided, realized that it added up to over $21 billion a month, which is $720 million a day, or $500,000 a minute. Now, does anybody in this room even make $500,000 a year? Is this Iraq or Iraq this and Afghanistan? Is, um, this is Iraq. This is just the war and occupation of Iraq. Wow. So, even more disturbing, they basically extended the, 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 the projected out to assume that U.S. troops are going to stay in Iraq until 2017, which is pretty conservative, although in declining numbers, if you do that, the costs amount to $3 trillion. And the book is called The $3 Trillion War. Um, so right now, um, each and every household it, of four people in the United States owes $16,748 just for the first five years of the Iraq occupation. Um, so you know, this is another potential organizing tool, just trying to talk to people about you know, how would you feel if you got a bill for $16,000 that you had spent in Iraq out of your tax dollars? Um, so, you know, after all of this money stuff, which is all very, you know, significant, but it's also very kind of um, impersonal, uh, of course the other costs include um, things that we can't name a price for. So, um, as of this morning, for example, uh, 4,235 U.S. men and women have lost their lives in Iraq. Um, we are talking about probably over 1 million Iraqi men, women, and children, although nobody has any hard numbers on that. Um, and millions of Iraqis have been displaced from their homes. And um, just countless bodies and spirits have been broken beyond repair on both sides, but there's really no way to measure. Um, despite, that the fact, uh, despite the fact that human lives are priceless, um, the current future and future medical costs of this war are very unique um, because we've got a whole other section that we need to think about. <coughs> Due to advances in battlefield medical care, more troops are surviving this war and occupation, but they're left with some of the most horrific injuries of any war. 
So 20% of those brought home are suffering from serious brain or spinal injuries or the loss of multiple limbs. Another 20% are returning with an amputation, blindness, or deafness, severe burns, or other dire medical conditions. Many will require 24-hour care for the rest of their lives. Um, multiple tours of duty, which are common now, are increasing the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. Um, and um, economist Linda Belms found that the U.S. government was keeping two sets of statistics about the wounded. Um, the Pentagon had issued a figure in 2008 of roughly 23,000 wounded, but the Veterans Administration was quietly using a number of 50,000 war wounded. So her conclusion is that for every soldier who dies in Iraq or Afghanistan, 16 are wounded, and those are people that we should be taking care of for the rest of their lives. And that is just a staggering amount of, of cost. I, I wanted to try a couple of times to call in to uh, Ed Schultz uh, about the, 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 what the, the Kogel 2006 uh, 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 Kogel Award that this guy won uh, for the, I guess, three trillion dollars that's outstanding because they were complaining about well look there, there isn't any house hospital care the hospital this that and the other that could have gone to to so much and that's wasteful it, it that's crime that's what i'm talking about crime I'm in the really, military right. i'll ask anyone uh, we're going to have a time for questions and answers all right. after all right. let's, no, let's right. those presentations yeah let me finish sure. is that good yes. 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 So the other ways that the other hidden costs about this war that um, that aren't included in these price tags are the ways that we're not able to spend this money. And so here's just a quick um, study that the Institute for Policy Studies did of researching the number of jobs that can be created by spending one billion dollars in six different industries. So this is another argument that we get a lot, I think, uh, you know, in the peace movement is. Well, but there are, the, there are these jobs. People can go into the military and get, and get these jobs, and these are creating jobs for people. Well, as you can see, military spending actually creates the least amount of jobs of any of these other industries. Um, not only does mass transit generate over twice as many jobs, but they're higher paying jobs than the military jobs. And they do they have these other side effects like lessening pollution, allowing working class people better access to, jo to their jobs and to their lives. Um, so this really demonstrates very specifically that if we could move this money into these other industries, it would actually um, you know, meet our community needs better than military spending does. And, um, and you know, what else could our money buy? Well, I think we all remember what happened in, uh, in Minnesota. <laughs> with uh, you know, the, the bridge that collapsed. I mean, obviously, um, we have aging and deteriorating infrastructure that is creating much more debilitating effects on our economy, um, which is another cost of the money that we have been spending on this war that wasn't spent other places. Um, in 2005 alone, this is a study by the Brookings Institute, not exactly the most leftist organization on the planet, and in 2005 alone, Los Angeles lost almost $10 billion because its ports, roads, and railways could not handle the big cargo containers that wanted to enter the US. Um, Chicago lost $4 billion in economic activity because of its outdated railway system. And these are other examples of money that was lost um, because our resources were squandered in war and not on upgrading our infrastructure. Um, and then this, uh, <clears throat> another study by the New York Times, or another article in the New York Times, showed what our money could buy if we had um, spent it on other things. Here, sorry. Mm -hmm. So $1.2 trillion uh, that would be, were available for peace rather than destruction could potentially double cancer research uh, and treat every person in the United States who has diabetes or heart disease. Um, a question. Is the doubling, would that cost 1.2, or are this all, all adding up? Okay. So this entire list Perfect. is going to add up to $1.2 trillion. We could have a global child immunization campaign for 10 years, and we would still have money left over for universal preschool for all three and four-year-olds in the United States, improved baggage and cargo screening, which was in the 9-11 Commission as a recommendation to improve our safety, a huge increase in rebuilding funds for New Orleans, and we could still pay 
some money to have, send a peacekeeping force into Darfur to stop the genocide. All of that for a third of the war in Iraq. One third. And we still have two thirds of that money left over to come up with another list of things to spend it on. So um, some of you might have seen the banners in the main room downstairs. Um, AFSC has developed this campaign about what $720 million could buy. Um, we have t-shirts, we have posters, we have the banners at our table downstairs. And this is just an example of an organizing tool. These are available for any group who wants to either use the slideshow presentation, we'll, we can share that. We can bring the banners to any um, events, um, town halls, community meetings, meetings with legislators. Um, and you know, it really just allows people, if you've seen the posters, you can fill in like what your, how you would want to spend the $720 million. Um, and it's just a way to kind of quantify what we're talking about for people and try and, and get more people to understand what exactly we're, we're talking about. So. All right, thank you very much. Uh, what I think actually uh, is a nice segue from, from uh, Katie's presentation. This is a list of trade-offs. This was developed uh, by a gentleman named Seymour Melman. Does anybody know who Seymour Melman is? The name of his. He wrote a book called Permanent War Economy. He really devoted his life to the issue of uh, the destructive um, influence of our military budget, and in particular to the idea of, of economic conversion. And uh, hopefully everybody is familiar with Eisenhower's uh, farewell address, where he uh, introduced, uh, he didn't introduce this concept, but he talked about the concept of military industrial complex. And this was really the focus of, of Seymour Mellon's work. He was an industrial engineer at, at Columbia University. He passed away in 2003, I think. Any more? That's all I have, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe we can get share them. Um, I want to mention uh, not so much uh, the kind of exceptionalism that we just saw, right? We're, we're at, we initiated a war, first in Afghanistan and now in Iraq. These are ongoing occupations, which are essentially ongoing wars. Uh, but what I want to talk about are, are the, the basic the institutionalization of militarism in our country, and in particular, how uh, what is what is this notion of a uh, military industrial complex? What we have, what has developed uh, in this country, is a system whereby, because of the defense outlays, you had the emergence of defense-only industries. Uh, after the Second World War, after the First World War, industries uh, during the war were converted to military use and then reconverted to civilian use after the war. But because of lessons, uh, some people argue mistaken lessons, about uh, what can happen in terms of an economic contraction after a war, this, people hit upon this idea, some people argue it was unconscious, of military Keynesianism. We've heard a lot about Keynesianism, John Maynard Keynes, this idea that the government has a role in terms of massive government spending to essentially bring uh, capitalism through its ongoing crises. We, you know, this, the plenary sessions sort of talked about that. So what we have in this country is an institutional form of uh, a permanent war economy and that's how our government intervenes in the, in the economy. Why not intervene in the economy directly by social programs, by building schools, by rebuilding infrastructure? The argument is that military spending you can justify by basically fear mongering, by keeping the population frightened. And so in that way you can justify government intervention in the economy, massive government outlays that subsidize, for example, the computer industry, I work in the consumer electronics, I'm an engineer in consumer electronics, that industry would not exist were it not for the massive uh, defense spending that went into creating the computer industry. Uh, computers were, were, way too comp were way too expensive, but if the government pays for them, then industry can eventually develop, they get, might, they get uh, uh, miniaturized, and suddenly it's a commercial product. So this was the way the government could intervene in the economy. But what, what would be the reason we don't do that in the civilian sector is that it sends precisely the wrong message to the broad population. It sends to the population, the government can make your life better by spending. And that's, of course, not what uh, industry would like. In part, I'm gonna, there are a number of reasons for this, but let's take, take one. One would be that the government then competes for industry in these various areas of development, of infrastructure that they want to make profits from. 
Now, it then becomes an interesting question. I'm not going to go into it now. Well, uh, if, they're, if, it's, if it's all outsourced, aren't they just as happy with that? So that, I'm going to leave that as an open question. So we have then this industry that now has a very key self-interest in the ongoing defense spending of the nation. And you get what's this, this, uh, this idea of the Iron Triangle. You have industry that because they're getting these massive uh, uh, contracts and they're co typically cost plus contracts, that is, you bid, but you, you ensure that even if you have cost overruns, you will always get a profit because it's cost, it's cost plus contract. It's written in the contract that even if you go over budget, you still make a profit. So you get a concentration of wealth in these industries, which then, of course, have lobbying arms that secure their influence in the next appropriations bill. So you have that very destructive cycle that's set up. In addition to that, you have it institutionalized, whereby nowadays, whenever there's a big budget uh, military defense item, there is a conscious effort to make sure that bits of those, that large project end up being uh, in each and in as many congressional districts as possible. So that then each of these Congress representatives who are going to be voting on this appropriation now have a personal stake among their constituencies because of the defense industries. So, um, so this is what I'm trying to get at is the, the institutionalization of this process and why what we need uh, is a rather radical transformation of the political process. Now, there are some uh, elements of hope in that respect, but I want to mention, uh, just to touch on, where am I at? I got to uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to touch on one element of how this uh, has really undermined uh, the economy in a, very, in a very substantial way. And why, for example, when the uh, Chinese government decided they wanted to put in a, one of these uh, magnetic levitation high-speed rails, who did they go to in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the engineering expertise, the company that would build this for them? Well, it was Germany. Um, when a company becomes a defense contractor, like I work in a sort of uh, engineering business, so, the con so reading about this, the, I've, what I've seen is sort of the spin-off of this. You work on a cost plus basis, there's no incentive to take cost out of your product. There's no, in fact, it's just the opposite. The more, the more cost, the greater the cost overruns, because your cost plus uh, contract is typically a percentage, the greater your profits. Now you can imagine how that makes any kind of co company uh, just uncompetitive, anti-competitive. It can't possibly compete in the commercial sector. Now, in addition to that, uh, something that Katie, Katie in the AFSC presentation talked about the opportunity costs. What you're also doing by, by creating this massive uh, financial outlay into a particular engineering and scientific sector of the economy is taking a truckload, truckload is not, not the right word, a massive percentage of the engineering and scientific resources of the country and devoting them to the creation of waste. So let's, let's illustrate this with a concrete example. If I create a tank, that tank basically has one, one function. It's to be used perhaps in a preemptive way. That's the best you can hope for. It's going to maybe prevent the war from starting by scaring people. But, it, but that's the most you can hope for, is it's going to sit idle. That's what you hope. It's not going to do anything. Now suppose you build a bulldozer. And I'm not going to set aside the armored bulldozers that are used by the Israelis to destroy houses in the West Bank and Gaza. You build a bulldozer, you have created what some people will refer to as a means of production. That mixing with the labor of several individuals can be used to, for example, dig the foundation for a school or a hospital. That is the multiplier effect, concretely realized, that Katie is talking about in terms of spending money on infrastructure versus spending money on, on the military. On the military, you get definitely some kind of uh, stimulus. But you don't get that multiplier effect of creating the possibility of the creation of additional wealth within the society. So with that, I know I've gone too long. I just wanted to sort of seed those kind of ideas in terms of the discussion. You, you said something speak. about the permanent no. military. It <laughs> says in our Constitution there shouldn't be, and so did Thomas Jefferson. He said there never should be. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, John, do you want to add some things? Uh, well, I just wanted to add one thing. 
what Will said, and that is that you know when you have these kind of contracts and so forth, and you also have a standing army in place, which we do now, it really becomes not just being prepared for war, but really there's an incentive for war. It, it really is profitable to these companies that we go to war, and and we also have we also have this um, person power in terms of a standing army that we. You know, why not use it? It's there, you know, and people are being paid so forth and train and so you know, it's really an incentive to go to war almost. Yeah, and I will add to that is that now it's a very very good business to make wars because you go and destroy it and then you have the big companies to reveal those destructions, right? And it goes the same hands always to the city. So now let's let's just start in uh, I see some hands here. Uh, let's put about five minutes or so of questions and answers that help to kind of um, complete a little bit the idea that came out from the presentations. Yes. Can I ask one of the speakers to speak on the black budget? Oh, yeah. On the what? Black, black budget. budget. Black Secret budget. budget. You have anything? I don't have any details on it, but we know it's a substantial part of uh, so-called defense or intelligence agency expenses. Do you have any number? Do you have any numbers? Yeah. You can no. Google it. I think it's kind of irrelevant to the argument. It is. Well, it's a lot. I think yeah, just the amount of money that we know about is staggering enough right. to like make people yeah. want to do something to change it, and you know. Exactly, yeah. it's a lot. Just, yes. just for information, people talking about the black budget are talking about all the money that is appropriated for uh, intelligence secret purposes. Mm -hmm. For example, I, I'm trying to do a cost comparison of the dollar coin to the dollar bill, right? And even those processes of manufacturing money are secret. I can't find out how much things cost, et cetera, et cetera. As we see how they, it, it works, you know, in the system, we can imagine that it's a lot again, you know. So let's see if we have questions and answers to the presentations, please. So I saw one hand, two, go ahead. Okay, well, one thing that strikes me is that there's no, there's a lot of it, it's not real money anyway. I mean, because it's all on the cup. We take out more debt, and we do that because we're scared for our safety. And so, and now, do we pay interest on that? And eventually, it may get paid out or not. Maybe the United States should just go bankrupt and start over. Our maybe government will be. Does. Maybe we are. But it's not real money. You said we're we just are. getting farther in the in our, the hole. Our, our government does. There's, we are the government. Yeah, that's why I got Please inquire. Yes. Well, I'm I'm does. happy to be a citizen and have some responsibility here. I'm responsible for war, though. Thanks. Okay. Say, come here, guys. But anyway, I saw you, you, and you. Yeah, I just had a question about the medical spending on vets on the chart that you had. Like, how is that actually calculated? Like, how do they know? Is it like a projection based on what they're spending now, or is it what we should be spending? Because right. those are two massively different. That, right. This this chart was Steve Lutz's analysis of what we're of a projection based on what we're spending now which is, yeah, uh, also not adequate <laughs> at all that we should be spending. But what he was doing was projecting out. So this is if we stay, this is how many wounded there are. So if we stopped now, we would be able to spend more money on to actually take care of the people and stop creating more wounded that we would then have to add to that bill. I would just like to inform everyone, if the World War II ended, the United States of America, us, were bankrupt. We're literally bankrupt. True figures. And when you're talking about what we're spending, we're not spending our money. We're spending the money of our great, great grandchildren. It was already spent. Oh, okay. We're bankrupt. And immoral. But we are the first generation in the United States of America who a sweet little gal, mother of two, a Wall Street bookkeeper, a fireman, Plain neighbors, America, us, 
have become knowledgeable enough to know that we're sick. And the way to get well is to personally, personally, not be immoral any longer. Set the right example. Don't fight. Don't call someone a name. Don't be prejudiced. Be loving. Thank you. Thank My you. example is plain. <coughs> Please. We, we, we have a little sort of I know. But this is what I do. I walk through the neighborhood and say to homeless people, would you like education? Would you like a bed? Now, whose bed am I giving? Not Union Gospel. A bed in my bedroom. We're going to have, we're gonna have uh, our hands. Hands. We have finished our time now. Uh, a little bit of. And actually, why we don't switch to that? Because it's already almost three minutes that we have left. And if we want to get a little extra minutes from the hour break, it will be 15 minutes until we get to the, the, the second part of the planning session. So now um, it's that part of the organizing. So what do we do with all of this information, this knowledge that we have? How can we really do something? So the first question is, do we know that there is something organized, that there is something going on that's working, uh, opposing all of this that, that we see? That is bad. What is it that out there? Yeah. That is working and that we know. I mean, I've, I've seen things in terms of military resistance and looking at the military, keeping our, our men and women from being deployed in the National Guard, for instance, um, trying to make Portland a sanctuary city, trying to build Iraq veterans, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans against the war to really get out, especially with the economy going down, really you know, counter recruitment efforts as well, looking at the military um, in particular as being a source of, of resistance, I think has started to become successful and, and got a lot of people knowledgeable about the issues. Thanks. Any other information? I think it's crucial that we bombard our congressional representatives and the president with our outrage about this. You know, there we know. I know there are people in the room that have boycotted or, or uh, picketed Luminar's office for a long time and so forth. You know, mm -hmm. but letters from massive amounts of people. I mean, that's a really impressive organizing thing that each of us can just do on a daily basis. Great. I think uh, I've, I've been getting into this. I heard recently that actual written letters are the least effective. It's more effective to phone, it's more effective to send email, and it's more effective to send faxes. But it's vital that we all, as Americans, no matter how we do it, contact our elected representatives and let them know what we want. Face to face. Yeah, and I, the thing that something that really bothers me is that, you know, um, that there's a recent bombing of Pakistan. And, and I think that all, all the spending we're doing now is, is terrible. If we expand and increase our efforts in Pakistan, I mean, I think we have to just stop that now. You know, find a way to extract ourselves from Iraq and all the other issues we're talking about. But do not expand the war into back into Afghanistan. Don't increase the war in Afghanistan. And if uh, letters and emails and all that, I mean, that's to me like critical. We'll never be able to do anything else. Yes, I didn't go into this, but I mentioned the idea of economic conversion. And especially as we had, one of the things that I think is very exciting about the, the presentation, but the situation we're in, it's very daunting. But as was pointed out, in a moment of crisis right now, as uh, institutions are being called into question, uh, the, the, the prospects, I think, open up much more widely. What, what's possible now uh, is far greater than what was possible even five years ago. Um, and economic conversion, it seems to me, is a way to confront the idea that cutbacks in military spending is going to hurt the economy. Whereas I think an investment in 
in, in promoting the idea of converting defense industries to actual productive uh, uses in society is something that I think perhaps now is, uh, is going to be uh, something that we're, that we're yeah, a receptive hearing in the, in, in the Congress today. Um, John, did you have any there's been a lot of discussion recently on the internet about how, um, you know, the, the economic crisis is really going to uh, be a boon for military recruiters, and then a lot of people, more people are going to be some young people are going to be signing up for the military because there aren't jobs and so forth. And I think one thing that we can do as a community is talk to young people about alternatives to the military. There are, there are things that, you know, that it is possible to get an education without going into the military. It is possible, and probably more effective really to get job training outside the military than within it. And so um, a couple of groups that I've been working with have done some work on this. We've produced some materials for young people suggesting alternatives, but I think it's really important that it be a community discussion, you know, so that um, young know, people who are graduating from high school um, have some options to work with. Exactly. And also helping to change the priorities in the government instead of giving the money through the military, giving the money through schools. So the students can really access to that, right? And they, it was you. I think what we need is nonviolent mass demonstrations. During the 30s, mm -hmm. the sit-down strikes in, in plants in the Rust Belt now uh, ac uh, accomplished that. Then uh, later during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, nonviolent demonstrations were necessary to get the attention of government. Then later, the WTO demonstrations in Seattle, the nonviolent aspects of it, got a lot of attention. I think the government finally decided that they were on the wrong road in some areas. Sure, please. So what is working? One thing that's working is what we're sitting in right now. This building. A church. Look at the sign. Just look at that sign before you leave. When you leave, look at my shopping cart outside the church that walks around all. What works? A Mahatma Gandhi in every neighborhood. Don't point to him. You be the Mahatma Gandhi. Set the example. Say, I believe in love. Five human needs drive every human being. Number one, love. We must love and be loved. Number two, security. We need our food, clothing, and shelter. But we don't need a second car. We need to admit and apologize <clears throat> for errors of our grandparents. We're sorry for massacring the Indians. We apologize for slavery of Negroes. We apologize for every sin. Use the word. There is right and wrong. Do your best to be a sweetheart. Be kind. Thank you very much. I think that uh, unless there's something that is very crucial that somebody wants to say the last thing, then we are going to kind of wrap up here. Is that, is that good? No more. So don't leave yet. Don't leave yet, please. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to say is, oh, there's two things. One is that uh, what comes up is that we need to do something, and that's very important. Uh, just talking and coming here, meeting and talking is very good. It's more important when we get uh, after this and what we do after this when we are uh, knowing more about these this, uh, issues, right? Getting organized. And learning from history, as, as anyone was saying here, things have changed because people have mobilized. People have done something as, as a movement, as a community, as a big country. Otherwise, it's not going to change. So how do we do that in my own uh, community, neighborhood, work, school, etc., all, all over? So I will encourage everyone to think about that and get more involved and organized. I don't like to ask how many people here wrote to Congress, how many people who did it, who didn't do it. Because, well, some did, some didn't, right? It's more like, if we do a very little thing today and do another one tomorrow, and then the day after tomorrow, we'll, we'll build up this, this power. So after that, I think that I will thank uh, all the 
the speakers here, thank you very much for all the knowledge that have been shared. It was very good. Okay. Yeah, I have the sign list the here. Uh, if the, you didn't sign up, put it here. And two things I wanted before you leave. One is about the march, the information. The other one is uh, the ladies from the com yeah, Committee of Solidarity. You need to support also have one little commercial about them. So anyone signing this? Did you didn't sign up? Uh, I didn't. No. Who has my pen? Okay. Okay. I got it. Well. Uh, so the, the, if you don't know, uh, the Committee of Solidarity which support the people that have been victims of raids and detentions by the ICE police, the immigration police, mm -hmm. and that uh, they are in this process, you know, uh, uh, stuck in the immigration court system and all of that, and they can't work. <coughs> and they are doing a fundraising, that's the way that they're surviving, and at the same time they're educating the community about, you know, the, the human face of the immigrant and immigration and all of that. So what they have here is uh, they're doing a, a this fundraising and they cook tamales and other things and, and they're doing one uh, a big production. So if you want to order, there's the flyers, you can order to them to that um, uh, electronic mail or what can you call it? Email mail. Email address, sorry. Uh, so they're going to distribute that and now I'll ask Will to inform about the other activities. So, uh, hopefully everyone has heard about the campaign to try to prevent the Oregon National Guard from being deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. There's a big mobilization set for uh, March 15th. It's down in Salem. If you want details, I'm sure you can get it at the PDX Peace website, pdxpeace.org, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, or the PPRC website, ppprc-news.org. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just put them up here so you can see what I'm talking about? So that's, uh, well, it works. Not at all. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll just say it again. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Might have it here. Right? It's <laughs> pdxpeace.org or pprc-news.org. Either of those websites and the Peace and Justice Works, which I can never remember, will have the information about the Salem mobilization and also information about the campaign to keep the Oregon National Guard here in Oregon. The resolution's been written. Uh, it's available now. Um, uh, so we want to obviously lobby the folks in Salem, our representatives and our uh, state senators, to support this resolution. Uh, it has a shot. Other states are doing it. It's a way to act locally to try to be uh, a great big obstacle to the uh, expansion and the ongoing war and occupation in Iraq. Will, yes. how can we get a copy of the handout if we didn't get one? Uh, if you, uh, I'm happy to, if you write to uh, me at pprc at riseup.net, I will make sure that you get a link to that handout. Thank you. Yeah. If yes. anybody wants, I'd rather have an electronic one than a paper one, if anybody wants this one. And there are brochures on the Keep the Guard Home campaign at the PDX piece uh, table. table and buttons also. This is a really important campaign. We need lots of people to contact their legislators. I have some here if anybody wants one. <coughs> There's also the lobby day. That's the lobby next day. day. The lobby day on the 16th. Yeah. Uh, the next day, people are going to be going out into the legislative offices to lobby representatives. If you want to take part in that, the Rural Organ Organizing Project is heading up that, that whole outreach effort. I want to thank Marco for doing a great job. <laughs>